We proudly welcome artist Samantha Sherry as our sponsor on the How to Love Lit podcast. Sam is a world-class artist specializing in animal portraits. We invite you to check out her work at samanthasherry.com. Tell her Christian Gary sent you. Again, samanthasherry.com. Christy Shriver, and we're here to discuss books that have changed the world and have changed us. And I'm Gary Shriver, and this is the How to Love Lit podcast. Before we begin, let me encourage you once again to share an episode with a friend. We really appreciate your support. Uh, and today, we conclude our discussion of one of the most widely read political books of all time, uh, Niccolo Machiavelli's book, The Prince. It's uh, apparent advocacy of immorality as a means to success has enraged people literally for centuries. However, uh, at the same time, the popularity of the book has only increased across time and space. And that suggests that, that in spite of the outward apparent outrage, there is much in this book that leaders have decided to consider and embrace seriously. On the flip side, uh, I find this one of the harder books to sit down and actually read. It's organized by a series of often apparently contradictory assertions, and these assertions are defended um, through the use of historical and biblical and for what would have been at uh, his current time examples. Um, easy enough format, except that most of us don't understand his examples, and we haven't studied classical history, nor do we know his contemporaries, uh, but in spite of this obvious challenge to claims are so counterintuitive and fascinating that readers are compelled to keep struggling through the examples in spite of the difficulties. Well, that's it exactly. And while at first you think, I can't believe he's saying this, the more you read, the more he makes sense. Although I will say, and this is what we looked at at episode two, if you haven't gone back and listened to it, understanding the basic definitions that are driving this book Definitions that aren't necessarily the way we understand words like virtue and fortune will really help you draw the correct conclusions and follow the intended line of reasoning in the book. Otherwise, it's just a book of interesting quotes, but it's not that. It's a book with a single inherent driving theme. And I think for most of us, finding the thread that pulls all these maxims together is the challenge. What is the single driving theme of this book? Are these things connected? And more importantly, are these things that I should be practicing myself? Or am I supposed to be avoiding people who behave like this? <laughs> uh, should we say yes to all the above? Uh, and really, that was the broader question we discussed last week as we tackled some of his more controversial pieces of advice. Um, for example, his advocacy of deceit his advocacy of being willing to do evil in order to do good. And uh, there's just no way to read these chapters without wondering if Machiavelli is promoting evil as a means to get what you want and then justifying evil by claiming altruistic motives as a defense for basically self-centered practices. Well, and that sort of thing that you just described, we all know evil people that do that. And Although most, most of us will be burned once or twice <laughs> after a while, we catch on to this kind of deceptive behavior and we resent that. We resent these shallow claims of self-righteousness from bad people doing bad things in the name of goodness. Exactly. Uh, and we've argued defending uh, evil in the name of goodness is not... What Machiavelli is doing is not what he's saying. For one thing, the just cheat mentality seems an overly um, simplistic tactic that really wouldn't entice millions of people over hundreds of years. Um, also, Machiavellian scholars who've read all of his writings, uh, not just The Prince, but they've read The Art of War, The Discourses of Levy, um, his plays, as well as a multitude of letters, they argue that Machiavelli's work is much more sophisticated than that kind of reductionist approach. We will argue here that his work is actually an argument designed to help good people, 
not help bad people become successful in a world as aggressive and, and to use a Darwinian expression defined by survival of the fittest, not survival of the kindest. What Machiavelli does in politics is what every counselor or psychologist tries to get their clients to do in therapy sessions, and that is be honest about what you are seeing and about what you are doing. Uh, Don't pretend things are the way you wish they were. You need to own, however unpleasant, the realities of your life the way things really are and adjust your thinking to who you are and what the world is really like around you. And maybe my favorite line in this whole book um, is in chapter 15 when he says, For how we live is so far removed from how we ought to live that he who abandons what is done for what ought to be done will rather learn to bring about his own ruin. So Machiavelli believes it's, it's not that I want the world to be corrupt. I'm just telling you it is corrupt. <laughs> You must face this fundamental truth about humanity, and this is particularly true about politics. Well, you know, a few years ago, uh, my oldest daughter, Anna, was working in the summer for a local politician campaigning for a local election, a state representative that was trying to represent our district here in Tennessee. And the politician is actually a wonderful man, and he had a long career of doing great things for our state. In fact, just last year, he was honored for his tireless efforts in creating legislation that ultimately ended up enhancing punishments and increased funding to stop human trafficking in our state. So by all accounts, this is a noble and successful politician. And we were talking about my daughter because she had been working on his campaign. And Anna, like many students her age, hadn't decided what she wanted to do for a living. And she wanted to find a way that she could use her gifts and talents, not just to make money, to, but to make the world better. And her boss, Jim, the politician, we were talking about this and what she might be doing after graduation. And Jim said to me, <laughs> keep Anna away from politics. It's a dirty business. And I don't want that for her. <laughs> I, was, I was shocked. What a thing to say. A man who had been so successful at it. And he apparently, and my, I mean, what do I know? But I right. thought he'd done a lot of good. <laughs> well, clearly uh, our friend is a man <laughs> who understands the problem of dirty hands. Uh, Because he wasn't saying that Anna wasn't talented enough or smart enough to be in politics. He was talking affectionately, really as a protective father towards a daughter, saying, I don't like this dirty business of making morally ambivalent choices and uh, of having to feel like you have to not be good. Uh, I don't like the moral incompatibility of humanitarianism and issues of politics. And it's what Machiavelli sees really as an impossible dilemma. For Machiavelli, it's not that he wants people to make morally ambiguous decisions. He's saying evil people force you into impossible situations. For Machiavelli, um, a leader sees his role uh, of leadership as one that creates really a world of safety and liberty, which is freedom to do what you want for for those that he's leading. Uh, He sees his role as one who's willing to stand in the gap so others can have the luxury to live lives pursuing their own innocence. He's defending liberty so that others will in turn be productive and build a good state, a state where people can enjoy, um, you know, creative choices and prosperity and safety. However, standing in this gap requires ruthlessness, boldness, and even cruelty at times. And that's what people don't want to think about. (laughs) No, they don't. And and this is inherent in leadership in every group. You know, for Machiavelli, uh, you must be prepared because if you can't be these three things, you will lose your state. Uh, only a man or woman of great virtue, as he defines it, can pull this off without himself being despised and hated. Well, in the last part of this book for me is best understood, because I have a hard time like grouping this book into sections, but for me, this last part is best understood if I divide it up by understanding the different groups that he's talking about. For Machiavelli, understanding the person or the group of people that you're dealing with is everything. I heard a wonderful lecture on YouTube by UT Austin professor Maurizio Viroli, one of the world's experts on Machiavelli. In fact, I've used a lot of his ideas uh, in this whole podcast series. But in one of his lectures, 
He asserts that Machiavelli insists that you must know the kinds of people you're dealing with in order to be successful and to think through your plans and light about what you know about what these people are, who these people are, what motivates them in the world. Um, Professor Vitrilli says this, you must know the geography of the passions of that person. I love that line. <laughs> Say that again. The geography of the passions of that person. That's an amazing thought. I know. And these passions are not the same from person to person or even from group to group group. Some people are aggressive and some people are ambitious. Others aren't. Some people are motivated by revenge and others aren't. So with that in mind, we have to jump into chapter 19 where we start today with this new metaphor. It's a famous metaphor, really. And and it's controversial because he says, a man of great virtue must know how to use the qualities of the fox and the lion. And you have to think about that. Well, lions are ferocious. And most of us, if we have any sense at all, we're scared of them. They intimidate us into submission, but not foxes. Foxes are different. Foxes are cunning. They're tricksters. So in some cases, he's saying you need to be a lion. In other cases, you need to be a fox. But even that, the bigger trick is going from one to the (laughs) other without, here he's going to say, without being hated. Because if you're too ferocious, you'll be hated because you're cruel. If you're too cunning, you'll be hated because nobody likes to be deceived. But Machiavelli says you have to have a lot of virtue because in reality, you're going to have to be deceitful and cruel. What do you think about that, Gary? (laughs) I, I think he's telling the truth. And, well, and as we said before, I don't really think Machiavelli's main point is to suspend all moral goodness in order to win, which is how he's commonly misunderstood. I don't think Machiavelli believes winners cheat, so cheat to win. Uh, the strong always beat the weak, so be strong. Uh, I mean, that's an easy book to write. It's almost obvious and a little too simple, really, to stand the test of time. Uh, I think it's important to keep in mind, and we see this uh, in the last part of the book, that Machiavelli sees the job of a leader is to have an almost like intuitive sense of who to trust and who not to trust, who is loyal to you and your state, and who is not, and treat each player differently, uh, play by different rules depending on the assessment of your opponent, which I think is really wise. Uh, We talked about this last week, and as you remember, he said that the ambition of regular people is to be as free as possible, to live life without oppression. But the nobles or the elites or the ruling class, whichever you want to call them, their ambition in life is to oppress, to control others. Uh, So I think when he says things like act like lions and foxes, he's talking in terms of treating and controlling the ambition of the elites, not the regular people, uh, and not even all elites. Because he absolutely assumes you need allies uh, and advisors and such. But he does seem especially worried about people with resources and competing interests. Uh, With regular people, you just need to keep from being hated. He says that a lot. Keep from being hated. (laughs) And it's a much easier task, according to him. Uh, Which is why he can take a guy like Cesare Borgia and make him a model of all people. Uh, Borgia butchered in cold blood, uh, powerful opponents. But but it, since it seems the people he butchered were people who were oppressing regular people, people weren't offended or threatened when he went after them. And in fact, this exercise of targeted cruelty seems to have made uh, Borgia the role model for Machiavelli that he is. Well, in chapter 19, we revisit what we called Machiavelli tip number nine last week, don't be hated or despised. And he's, of course, hammered that to death. But in this chapter, he's going to flesh it out and give ideas on things that you need to avoid in order to be hated or despised. And remember for Machiavelli, if you wind up being hated or despised, just forget it. (laughs) You're going to lose your stage. Time's up. I mean, he doesn't see any exceptions to this rule. And really, when I think about real life, I I can't think of any either. (laughs) Right. But so for Machiavelli, tip number 16 and how to avoid being hated or despised, he says, don't be weak. Now, that's my 
translation of <laughs> of, uh, of what he says because 15th century yes because the word he actually uses is don't be effeminate <laughs> but i'm going to modernize the terminology and kind of delete the sexist language but he describes so we can do that really because he gives a description of what he means with the word effeminate he defines it he says if you're effeminate it means you're changeable timid and frivolous now Machiavelli, those are not feminine characteristics, but vocabulary aside, I, okay, I see what you mean. Mm-hmm. A good leader or prince must be able to make a decision and make a decision bravely based on real things, not frivolous things, not stupid priorities. And for him, if you will do this, you can build a great reputation. Well, let me say this. Plenty of women do that. They make they, decisions. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Which, as we know from every chapter of this book so far, because if there's anything that he's been hammering from the very beginning, he's saying you have to make a great foundation, and a great reputation is part of that, that you need to always be building. And he says, you know, if you make a reputation of strength, for yourself because you can make decisive decisions this will protect you of all things from conspiracies now when i saw that connection i thought well that's an interesting link connecting strong decisions with the idea that that would stop uh conspiracies i mean it just seems like he just dropped that out of nowhere but obviously endless conspiracies and conspiracy theories were it seems as much a part of his world as they are from our world. And if you don't think there's conspiracies in our world, you haven't been on TikTok lately. (laughs) Machiavelli would tell you, if you're decisive and not hated, don't even bother with TikTok conspiracies or accusations. You're fine. They're just rumors. (laughs) Just ignore them. (laughs) True. And speaking of TikTok, I think that would meet his criteria for frivolous. (laughs) For sure. Well, back, back to conspiracies. Um, Besides giving several examples of conspiracies that went awry, his main defense of this assertion is by way of deductive reasoning. And he says this, the problem with conspiracies are that they are nearly impossible to get away with because the obstacles of pulling off a conspiracy are much greater than the obstacles in defending against one. Which I guess that makes sense. It's it's easier to to not conspire than it is to conspire. Yes, it is easier. Uh, So the first problem conspirators have is that they have to align themselves with people who hate the person in charge, uh, likely because they're out of favor, um, except by disclosing the conspiracy and backstabbing you and your co-conspirator could actually get what they want by betraying you in a conspiracy. So let me quote him. He says this, On the side of the conspirator is nothing but fear. Jealousy, suspicion, and dread of punishment, which frightens him. A conspirator has to fear before the execution of his plot. In this case, having a people for an enemy, he must also fear after his crime is accomplished, and thus he is not able to hope for any refuge. Yikes. Another problem is the conspiracy secret is forever. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're never over the dread of discovery. I mean, it's it could happen any time. And he basically says, unless people absolutely despise the prince, there will be somebody who's willing to expose the conspirators. Maybe not before, but eventually. And that's where he leads us into chapter 20, directing our focus again, not on elites or nobles who may conspire, but back to regular people. It is interesting that he does seem to break the world into these two groups of elites versus regular people. And he applies two sets of rules. One he applies to the elites and the other he applies to to regular people. So Machiavelli tip 17 is super straightforward. And he's talking about regular people. He says this, arm your people. Now, when I ultimately understood what he meant as a teacher, this ended up being my favorite tip, but it took me a long time to get there because at first pass, I found it shocking. The idea of arming people uh, is something that I, because I live in the South, is something that I've thought about in the United States. Most of the world knows America has a Bill of Rights, and the Second Amendment of the Bill of Rights gives Americans the right to bear arms. Uh, And this isn't an idea that 
a lot of people from other parts of the world, including me, was very comfortable with. I grew up in Brazil, and in Brazil, we people don't have guns. I don't ever remember seeing anyone besides a soldier with a gun until I went to college. Because when I moved into Arkansas, there is a gun in every <laughs> truck. And I just about flipped out. I was scared to death. Who are these crazy people? Because I'd always considered guns as aggressive. In my mind, if you have a gun, that means you want to kill somebody. But Arkansans and Machiavelli, I'll say, they don't see it that way. They see it differently. Uh, the Arkansans thought I was irresponsible because I didn't have a gun and I wasn't taking responsibility for my own protection. And guns are made to make the world safe from bad people because bad people are bent on violence towards vulnerable people. And you shouldn't be vulnerable uh, because if you're vulnerable, you're enticing bad people to do bad things. Well, Machiavelli could have been an Arkansan. Oh, my. Don't say that, please. <laughs> he had no problem with citizens with weapons. I, I, I don't want to put all Arkansans in the same group, but I'll, I'm just making a joke. But anyway, Machiavelli takes it farther than that because he says wise princes arm their subjects, giving their subjects weapons or giving them tools to defend themselves. He says by doing this, you empower them not just to protect themselves, but they actually protect the state. In fact, Machiavelli goes, and this is a little extreme, uh, but he says it's not really bad to you know, start outside threats and force people to use their arms to protect themselves, just to keep them sharp. Gary, is that too much? <laughs> oh, so many thoughts on that. So many political discourses. But it reminds me of Thomas Jefferson when he says, the tree of liberty needs to be watered oh, with the blood of tyrants oh, from time dear. to time. And he says, revolutions are like storms in the environment. You know, Oh, my so, metaphor after metaphor. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, there does seem to be a little element um, of the perverse there. I mean, start wars to buy loyalty. It's <laughs> happened many times. Uh, but we see that uh, that principle again, that, that people are all loyal to the things they invest in. So in a sense, he's not being inconsistent with things he said in the past. Uh, the idea of arms, of course, he's speaking of literal arms or, or weapons, uh, which is why our minds immediately go to guns. But honestly, if you're just talking about the principle uh, or, or value, uh, equipping your people to defend themselves could have all kinds of applications that don't have anything to do with weapons. Uh, it could be applied to education or other resources people could use to defend themselves uh, that might be more practical than guns in today's world. And the idea of empowering people to take care of themselves and others, I know, I know is what you like about this principle, You're right. not guns per se. Well, we do feel loyalty to those who empower us and help us learn how to defend ourselves. And a prince who empowers his people to defend themselves or, or to be self-sufficient is going to be a prince that's beloved. And of course, his conclusion at the end of this chapter is the best fortress to be found in is the love of the people. Another brilliant quote I'd like to point out. <laughs> Which he states is not bought. He says you don't buy the love of the people by indulging them, but it's bought instead by empowering them and leading them to do great things. And that's what makes a great state. I really do find it a core value to keep in mind uh, when you read this book, that for Machiavelli, a prince seeks glory, but he seeks not his own glory per se, but he connects his own glory with the glory of the state. So if his state is great, he's great. He links these two destinies. It's the same word for both things. You don't get glory by being self-serving or using other people to indulge yourself. You get glory by building up those around you. Uh, yes, this is the key difference between a prince like Machiavelli would define as a prince versus the narcissistic prince that may use Machiavellian principles. And this is main point of what constitutes uh, ultimate success or glory. And I'll throw in a couple of Italian terms myself. Oh, dear. <laughs> Give it a go. Grandeza. There you go. <laughs> and Gloria. 
greatness and glory. Greatness and glory. Um, a narcissist seeks glory only for themselves, and he defines greatness differently. Uh, Machiavelli's prince seeks glory for his state, and he identifies the greatness of the state with his own personal greatness. And this important distinction brings him glory, which is greater than oneself, greater even in one's own lifespan. Uh, glory is a, a little bit of immortality. This is something that perhaps can be lost if you look at only the prince in isolation, which is what we're doing in this podcast series, that we must remember Machiavelli's body of work is larger than this. Um, in the discourses, he actually defends republics, and he makes an interesting point emphatically that um, people who live in liberty are stronger, they're more self-sufficient, and they're more prosperous. Uh, so a prince who empowers people is building a great state for himself, and he's building glory for himself. And the greatness of the state, not necessarily the person, produces the glory. So understanding that, I think it's not a stretch to apply the concept of arming people to empowering people. Oh, I agree. Because when the prince gets glory in the way that he's defining it here, everyone benefits. When the people are strong, the state is strong. When I read chapter 21, I can see a tip that supports this point of view. Machiavelli, tip number 18. 18. <laughs> I like this one too. Create great enterprises and give proof of prowess. In other words, come up with a great vision to pass on to your people. Have a great idea. In the American context, my mind immediately goes to the late President JFK, because one of the texts that we study in the 11th grade here in Memphis is JFK's inaugural address, and he talks about all the things that he wants to do with his presidency, lots he didn't get to do, but lots he did, like starting the Peace Corps. But one thing that JFK mentions in his inaugural address, and he does, uh, which I think is an excellent example of a great enterprise is what he did with the space program. JFK threw out the goal that Americans were going to the moon and going first. Now, I really don't know the practical reason for going to the moon, although I know there are people out there that can tell me all kinds of advanced technology oh, from results. Our STEM friends. I know from that. this kind of endeavor, but I don't really know. If, of course, I don't know, but maybe JFK had a great enterprise in mind, Machiavellian style. I mean, the 60s were a difficult decade. There's problems with racism, a war in Vietnam, the Cold War. Everyone's afraid of the nuclear bomb. And then he has this idea to go to the moon. It's a bright spot. And America landing on the moon has been in so many movies. We're so proud of this. And no matter what problem America was facing in other areas, we were proud of this great American enterprise. So a prince, according to Machiavelli, should contrive, make up, create great enterprises. And not just for himself, he should be on the lookout for other people and reward other people who are also contriving or are willing to contrive great things. And this is going to take us to Machiavellian tip number 19. A great leader rewards greatness. If someone does something great, celebrate it. He encourage it. Throw your resources, your finances, your the things that you have at great ideas. Make people aspire. Ooh, I want to be like that guy. He says to make people believe that is it is within their reach to also be great. Maybe be their own prince in some sense. He he uses the phrase be a lover of merit. Offer rewards to those who do great things. Honor those who excel at any art. He, this is what he says. Excel at every art. And of course, this is counterintuitive, and it's not something we do in the area of education at all. We have a tendency to throw most of our resources at failures, at the bottom, at people who do nothing or aspire to do nothing because we think if we could just give them enough resources, they would do something. Well, he's going to reverse this kind of thinking. He's going to say, throw your resources at those who are displaying energy, who are overcoming personal obstacles. These are the people that have merit. And other people will see that. And what you do is you actually 
elevate everyone in the process. True. Uh, and, and he applies this to taxes. <laughs> <laughs> but you can abstract it to other areas as well. I mean, give people incentives to be productive instead of incentivizing them to do nothing because they fear the prince that the state will take away what they have or take it away from them and take credit for what they did do. And um, Discourses of Levy, book two, chapter two, highlights this again and explains it really even more fully, saying people actually have more children <laughs> when they feel like they can afford to do so. I guess that makes sense. Yes. He says, uh, all the towns and provinces that live freely, they make very great profits for larger people are seen there because marriages are freer and more desirable to men. (laughs) The principle we see here in the discourses, um, but also in the prince, is that states grow when people are free to pursue their own greatness. Under freedom, the population expands. So uh, citizens do not fear their, uh, their patrimony will be taken away. And citizens can, through their own virtue, and remember that means for Machiavelli, our own personal strength and effort, uh, they can also become princes. And he applies this to all areas ranging from agriculture to the arts. Uh, empowering individuals will make them willingly multiply those things people believe that they, that they want later to, to be able to enjoy their freedom uh, he offers historical evidences uh, from antiquity to prove this. Uh, so keep the state free and uncorrupt. A prince who keeps the state free and uncorrupt attains the greatest measure of glory. And really, if I think about my own life, I mean, I tend to work harder if I see an incentive to improve my life later. All right. So I think we've said enough about that. So I want to change directions because that's what Machiavelli does. He's going to make a sudden shift again because he wants to talk about outside alliances instead of this internal stuff that we've been talking about so far. He's going to say, and here is tip 19. 19. 19. When it comes to outside interests, and they're at odds with each other, so you got two outside groups that are at odds, pick a side. Never remain neutral <laughs> on anything. Don't be afraid to pick a side. And again, this kind of seems counter intuitive because when we have friends and two of them are arguing most of us are going to say keep me out of it i don't want to get in in between you two Uh, machiavelli might say that works with friends i don't know but he doesn't think it works with organizations and he says this is a surefire way to make both of the outside parties (laughs) hate you he claims that if you pick a side and that side wins, you're good, obviously. But if you pick a side and your side loses, the winning stay side has an incentive to try to get you over on their side, which so you could win either way. He says neutrality is actually the most unsafe place to be because hmm. it makes you wishy-washy or makes people think you actually had a preference and you just wouldn't tell anybody, so that makes you deceitful. He says it doesn't matter. Be strong and decisive. Better to be decisive and wrong than to be indecisive and neutral. <laughs> hmm. So these last chapters are a little harder to discuss. And uh, maybe because it's the end of the book and he's trying to wrap up all of his tips, but he changes directions multiple times. And um, he talks a lot of different about a lot of different and seemingly unrelated things. So uh, we see first in chapter 19, him talking about empowering people to be great. And we see him talking about choosing sides between adversaries and uh, now change directions again. And he discusses what he calls secretaries. Secretaries. Or as we would say, (laughs) people who work for you. Not necessarily as a secretary. Right. Uh, He makes a couple of claims that again involve a new prince um, who's not used to being in leadership and uh, not used to being in charge or handling the people that work for him, for him or her, or, or represent him or him or her, or advise him or her. Uh, the assumption again is that the prince will not be experienced enough to know who's loyal and honest and who is manipulative and self-serving. Well, and again, we see him highly prizing loyalty. But the problem is, and I've had this problem myself, even though I can't claim to be in high leadership of anything. But if you're the boss, everyone's trying to look loyal to you. And so the last bit of advice is really addressing this problem of not knowing how to pick advisors or collaborators because everybody's trying to look good. 
They are. And, you know, so now we're up to Machiavelli and tip 20 and tip 21. <laughs> First, at all cost, avoid flatterers. Avoid flatterers. That's an immediate tell. And second is to always keep in mind, and I quote, the first impression that one gets of a ruler and of his brains is from seeing the men he has about him. Uh, the people you surround yourself with are extensions of you. So you have to be extremely careful and wise in picking the people closest to you. And of course, this is a tip every mother gives her child. Make good choices. Yes, your friends are important. But in the context of leadership, it gets even trickier because there's a great incentive if you have power uh, or authority for people who to want to be near you who also want to have access to power and authority. And he makes this kind of funny turn of phrase here. He says this, there are three kinds of brains and you can get away with two of them, but you can't get away with Mm. brain number three. So brain number one is the kind of brain that you can actually understand something unassisted. So sometimes I have brain number one, but sometimes I don't. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Then there's brain number two, the kind of brain that can understand something when it's explained or shown by others. And sometimes I have that. Maybe sometimes I don't, depending on the mathematical level of the question. (laughs) But then there's brain number three. If you have brain number three, you cannot understand anything, either by yourself or when someone's trying to... You are lost. Yes. So he says, if you have good people around you, you're okay if you have brain number one or brain number two. But if you're brain number three... You're done. You're lost no matter what, (laughs) which gets us to the problem we talked about right off the bat. So how do you use that, again, to pick people around you who can explain things to you that you can't understand for yourself? And if you're going to be as cynical as he wants you to be and think of all people as competitors or possibly deceiving you in order to get your power, how do you do that? Hmm. Well, I'm glad you (laughs) asked. Because, of course, he has a tip for that. Of course he does. Machiavelli tip number 22. And I quote, When you see the minister think more highly of himself than of you, and in all his actions seek his own profit, such a man will never be a good minister, and you can never rely on him. That makes sense. Well, in chapter 23, he expands on this further. And, of course, tip number 23. 23. And let me quote him again, because these are easy to quote. Let men understand that they will not offend you by speaking the truth, but when everyone can tell you the truth, you lose their respect, which is an interesting thing. I want to say that again. Let men understand that they will not offend you by speaking the truth, but when everyone can tell you the truth, you lose their respect. A prudent prince must therefore take a third course. By choosing for his counsel wise men and giving these alone full liberty to speak the truth to him, but only of those things that he asks and of nothing else. But he must ask them about everything and hear their opinion and afterwards deliberate by himself in his own way. Beyond these, he should listen to no one. Hmm. Well, it certainly goes against the idea of getting a wide range of opinions. Yeah, it kind of does. And the idea is I'm not going to ask you for your opinion until I want it. So don't just offer it up. (laughs) And limit it to only what I ask you about. Yes. He actually says a prince, therefore, ought always to take counsel, but only when he wishes, not when others wish. Uh, On the contrary, he ought to discourage absolutely attempts to advise him unless he asks for it. But he ought to be a great asker and a patient hearer of the truth. Um, He goes on to say, A prince who is not wise will never have united counsels and will not be able to bring them to unanimity for himself. The counselors will all think of their own interests, and he will be unable either to correct or even to understand them. Yes, and he ends with one more cynical line. For men will always be false to you unless they are compelled by necessity to be truth. In other words, and this is, I mean, I don't know how you can argue with this. Machiavelli, tip 24. Number 24. (laughs) Bear in mind that whatever their advice, no one will give you advice against their own personal self-interest. So unfortunately, often advisors' interests 
don't correlate exactly with the prince's interest. And the prince's state is his responsibility and his alone, in a sense. Remember, the advisor is trying to build up his own state as well. And we must remember that for the advisor, the state, as in the, the place and the his condition, aren't necessarily the same. But for the prince, they absolutely are the same thing. Well, chapter 24 um, circles back around to this idea that has also been present throughout every single chapter in the book. But he'll end the book on this idea of fortune and uh, the two most famous metaphors in the entire book. The first one I'll read, and I'll let you read the second one and the more controversial one. Well, I can see why. Treat her like a woman. Oh, man. <laughs> I'm going under the bus. So, I mean, the, the premise of the entire book, uh, as we stated in episode two, rests on this idea that uh, all of us, but especially leaders, are up against fate. In other words, those things in life that we cannot control. Uh, and of course, we know this. Uh, so there's so much about life that we can't control. You absolutely cannot control your fate. Machiavelli would say that that's out of the question entirely. Sometimes fate or luck is on your side, and sometimes it's not. Machiavelli thinks if you were in leadership at all, you've obviously already had a little bit of luck. You can't get to the top without it. And however, uh, he does say this, fortune is the ruler of half our actions, but that she allows the other half or thereabouts to be governed by us. I would compare her to an impetuous river that, when turbulent, inundates the plans, casts down trees and buildings, removes earth from this side and places it on the other. Everyone flees before it, and everything yields to its fury without being able to oppose it. And yet, though it is of such a kind, still, when it is quiet, men can make provisions against it by dikes and banks, so that when it rises, it will either go into a canal or its rush will not be so wild and dangerous. So it is with fortune, which shows her power where no measure have been taken to resist her and directs her fury where she knows that no dikes or barriers have been made to hold her. You know, I really like this metaphor as seeing fate as a river. Uh, I can understand that and I can visualize it. First of all, I like the idea that luck does change and we see this all the time. I mean, just the other night, we were playing Trivia Pursuit, Gary and I versus my daughters and my brother. And the first 15 questions, Gary and I did not get a single answer right. They were so hard. And my daughters and brother, they got all of theirs right, and they were pulling ahead. But then, luck, the river, changed <laughs> courses. Hmm. All of a sudden, we got all the easy questions, and they got all of the hard questions. And of course... We pulled out ahead, and we won. It wasn't fair, to be honest. I'm not sure we were the smartest people in the room. But fate turned, and you can't control the order of random cards, just like you can't control a lot of things. But Machiavelli says that part of it is only half. You will be defeated by fortune at times. You're going to get bad cards. But you can be admired, even when you get bad fortune, if you can keep your dignity in defeat, because times will most certainly shift. Fortune will most certainly change. And you can win, in, but and unlike the card game, this is where the breakdown falls down with the cards, you can prepare for the next round. Because in life, unlike cards, there are things that you can control. And that's what I like about this metaphor. When a flood is coming, you can build defenses before it happens and you can prepare so that when the luck changes, it doesn't topple you. Fate only controls some things, but there are some things that you can absolutely do to protect yourself against it. And of course, the most famous metaphor in the entire book, that's what the next metaphor is. And the one that might explain why Machiavelli was single. <laughs> That's a joke. I know he had girlfriends, but Gary, I think you should read it. <laughs> yes. And why should I read it? So I can mock. Yes. Always. <laughs> All right. So here we go. Fortune is a woman, and it is necessary, if you wish to master her, 
to conquer her by force. Oh, my. And it could be seen that she lets herself be overcome by the bold rather than by those who proceed coldly. And therefore, like a woman, she is always a friend to the young because they are less cautious, fiercer, and they master her with greater audacity. (laughs) Oh, my. It's such a charge statement. Oh, my. <laughs> well, I don't want to read it like the almost rape-like inferences that it appears to have, but people have mentioned that many times in the literature, including Machiavelli, I might add. But he is a man of his time, and, you know, we've already discussed that to death. But I will say, and this is a tip for guys, Women do prefer prefer bold men to weak men and brave men to cowards. Men that can take the lead in a relationship is what most girls really want. We may have to settle to do all the work, but we respect, admire, and even fall in love with bravery. So, boys, here's a Machiavellian love tip for you. You (laughs) Never be afraid to make the first move. Ask the girl out directly. Do not do the best friend run around move. Do not do the texting move, the discreet let's go by phone talking move. Just go to the door. Look her in the eye. Machiavellian style. Be bold. She might swoon. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) But, you know, most men, and this is a generic term, and most of us, it's just hard to be brave, and we're, we're really not. But what works for princes, okay, boys, here's another tip. Might get you a princess. Oh, just saying. <laughs> well, obviously, I'm not going to touch that metaphor. Uh, so I think we can finish out with chapter 25. Uh, and this unusual chapter, it's it's an exhortation, really, that uh, Machiavelli chooses to end his book with. Um, as we know from uh, history and pointed out in the first episode of, of this chapter, Italy at this time was a land full of city-states. Uh, Most of these were constantly warring against each other and warring against the um, outside forces of France and Spain and other countries. Machiavelli, although throughout this entire book, tries to be as realistic as possible. In this chapter, it exposes the idea that he, too, can be a dreamer and a patriot. Yes, he can. This is one reason why I absolutely believe Machiavelli is not Machiavellian in the way this word has evolved, which is to mean a self-serving, corrupt, and evil tyrant. Well, I completely agree. Um, Machiavelli chooses to end his work with a chapter, and it's full uh, of one of my favorite concepts in all of humanity. He talks about redemption. Among other things, it's a Christian concept. And so we see Machiavelli invoking a lot of biblical allusions in this final chapter, something that he's done a little bit, but not really in the rest of the book. He invokes God in a way that's very different than in the rest of the book. And for me, it feels almost inspiring, although I'm not a contemporary looking for a unifier of Italy in the 16th century, but Machiavelli has a dream for Italy. He loves Italy, and he wants it to be united, and he wants it to be a place of peace, a place of prosperity, a place free of corruption, a place full of liberty for all people. Now, this is nothing but a high-minded idea for all leaders. I mean, I don't even think you can deny that. Uh, Yes, um, but it's not a starting point. If you are a new prince, a new leader, you are either a founder of something that hasn't existed or you must redeem something that already exists but is in a state of corruption and brokenness. And Because if we're successful, there would not be a new prince. Obviously. And the exhortation at the end to me, elevates this work to some sort of noble end. He has taken us through how you might have found yourself in this position of new prince, likely through a lot of ambition on your part, a little luck. He takes us through the types of villains you're going to encounter as you try to develop your state. He brings to the front a lot of these moral dilemmas that you're likely to encounter, and lots of these are very sobering. He's says very plainly, you're going to have to get your hands dirty. You're going to have to lose any amount of high-minded innocence you thought you were going to have. But keep in mind, if you have great virtue, and by great virtue, great strength of character, great wisdom, and all these tips that are in here are designed to help you have those things, the goal that is within your reach 
is the redemption of your state. And I want to end by going back to chapter six, because I skipped uh, the two final tips, and there are other tips, but I want to finalize with these two, and we're going to call them tips 24 and 25. Tip 24, successful people follow paths drawn by others. And tip 25, take a lesson from an archer. Let me quote him. Prudent archers who, when the place they wish to hit is too far off, knowing how far their bow will carry, aim at a spot much higher than the one they wish to hit, not in order to reach this height with their arrow, but by help of this high aim to hit the spot they wish to. So there you go, princesses and princes. Aim high. You can unify people. You can maintain your state. You can, and let's use your Italian words, achieve grandeza and gloria. (laughs) (laughs) Well, so there it is. 25 tips from the great Niccolo Machiavelli. Um, Although I'll tell you now, there are more than 25 in this book. But for us, that's enough to think about. Uh, Next week, we will look at one of Machiavelli's inspirations, the father of humanism. How about that? You're an inspiration of Machiavelli and the father of humanism. And the sonnet. Uh, Don't forget the sonnet. And the sonnet. (laughs) Francesco Petrarch. Uh, And and I'll give you a spoiler. It it involves another mystery. So see you next week. But between now and then, stop by our social media pages and check in. We're on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and LinkedIn and all the rest that's out there. Uh, Stop by our website, howtolovelitpodcast.com. But most importantly... Share an episode with a friend. That's how we grow. Thanks for listening. Peace out. Peace out.